Good evening, and welcome to SJ's to ASA Student Chapters Faculty Primetime Program. My name is Sarah Emerson, and I'm currently chair of the SJSU ASA Student Chapter. Our program tonight is a faculty primetime event, the sixth in the series, which features SJSU SLIS faculty speakers presenting on topics relating to their professional interests and experiences. Tonight's presentation will last approximately one hour. The speaker will take questions during the presentation in addition to answering questions in a Q&A session after the presentation concludes. At this time, I will now turn the mic over to Frank Florian, the SJSU ACES Student Chapter Program Director, who has the distinct honor of introducing tonight's guest speaker. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Sarah. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Frank Florian. I'm the program director for the SJSU ACES student chapter here at San Jose State. Our speaker tonight, Virginia Tucker, hang on, let me advance the slide here real quick. Our speaker tonight, Virginia Tucker, is a member of the full-time faculty at SLIS who teaches courses in information retrieval and online searching. She also works part-time as a public law librarian and is currently a PhD candidate through the Gateway program offered here at SLIS in partnership with the Queensland University of Technology. Her career in information services began as head librarian at the Stanford University Physics Library. She was recruited by Dialog Thompson, now called ProQuest, to their SciTech client services and training group and eventually was promoted to manage client training programs for the company worldwide. Her intense engagement with students and other instructors during that time gave her a deep understanding of how searchers perceive and misperceive database structure, search protocols and concepts, and techniques for searching efficiently and cost-effectively. She has developed and written many teaching guides, multimedia tutorials, and self-study user guides. Her key professional passion is teaching and researching how it is that people learn to search for and find information. Professor Tucker was out awarded the SLIS Outstanding Lecturer Award in 2011. In tonight's talk, Professor Tucker will present highlights from her current research into how good searchers become expert searchers, addressing critical concepts that need to be understood, regardless of the search engine being used. So without any further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome and a virtual round of applause to our speaker tonight. Virginia Tucker. Thank you for that nice introduction, Frank, and uh, thanks to everyone who's here tonight. Um, I appreciate it very much. I know it's uh, getting near the end of the semester and it's a, a crazy busy time for, for most of you, I'm sure. I see a lot of familiar names from different courses that I teach and that's always um, uh, very encouraging to see. So I thank you again for being here. Um, the research that I'm going to be talking about, um, and I've titled the talk, What Does It Mean to Be an Expert Searcher in a 2.0 World, is my PhD research it's something that's really the culmination of my interest in how people learn to search and in particular how they become experts at searcher at being a searcher. Um, because those of you here listening are in the MLIS program for the most part and looking at being um, much better at searching than your average person who uses Google on a regular basis. So I do want to also mention that because I'm in the PhD program, that might be something you'll want to ask questions about, and I'd be happy to um, answer questions as well about that. Because of the San Jose State Gateway program, it's made it possible for me to work on my doctorate while living in Bellingham, Washington, and I've been in the program for um, just about three and a half years at this point. In this program, I have two advisors who were at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia, as well as one advisor here at San Jose State, Dr. Judy Weedman, whom you may know. 
So we'll get started. And there's been a lot of study of the expert searchers and professional searchers and information intermediaries and information brokers. But what I'm looking at here is trying to fill the gap in our understanding of how a novice searcher becomes an expert searcher and what that means in today's information environment. I'm looking at what conceptual thresholds a learner passes through on the way to becoming an expert. What concepts I'm interested in are those that transcend the search engine that might be used and what the search environment is, whether it's you know, Dialogue or Factiva or Google or whatever it might be. So, um, and also separate from any kind of subject domain knowledge that they might have uh, using Medline, for example, or legal databases that require quite a bit of knowledge about the uh, subject domain and content. So that's what I was interested in and that's how the research was formulated. So given those objectives, let's take a little bit of a look at the context Again, uh, online searching is certainly an activity undertaken by almost everyone, it seems, at this point, who is online on the one side of the digital divide. And our understanding of what constitutes an expert searcher needs some fresh examination. A lot of the research was done over 20 years ago, and I think it needs a fresh examination. So in fact, a considerable challenge faced by my study has been that many would question why search expertise is necessary at all, or even what it is. So certainly when the name of a search engine becomes a commonly used verb, often used synonymously with the word search, we have traveled far beyond uh, the signpost that society has embraced search as a normal part of just getting things done. So our understanding of what constitutes search expertise needs to be re-examined and even questioned. So that was a big part of even putting this research study together and designing it. And the other factor is indeed that as the intelligence of search engines continues to increase, the question is what does the expert searcher bring to the search interaction? What do they bring to the table? and to the ultimate outcome of any search that might be conducted. But yet there is a professional searcher thriving and doing quite well. Um, thank you very much. And in MLIS programs in the United States and elsewhere, students are being tasked with learning how to prepare themselves for careers in information science that demand that they be far more than very good at Googling. So back to these research objectives, take a look at them again here, if I can get my pointer to work, there we go, it's always fun. We're looking at how a novice searcher becomes an expert searcher, and again, another way of expressing this is what are the conceptual thresholds, rather poetic way of expressing it, that a learner journeys through on the way to becoming an expert. And I do want to emphasize that not everyone, excuse me just a minute, I want to emphasize that not everyone becomes an expert. There's a lot of research quite clear on that point. But I believe that what's going to be important about this research is that we can teach to this. We can teach to the trajectory in the direction of expertise. So we'll take a quick look first at the research literature. Um, you all know that uh, you start to, by taking a look at what's already out there. And my literature review was rather complex and multi-layered. Uh, I delved into a lot of different areas, so I'm not going to dwell on this um, terribly long or we would be here all night and we definitely don't want to do that. So I looked into the literature that I call the setting, and this is the literature that's all about search behavior, particularly looking at web-based search behaviors and professional searcher behaviors. Then I also looked at what I call the backdrop, and this is a broad area of research on novice expert 
studies, and it has to do with this goes back years and years, and it crosses all kinds of disciplines, and it's, it's fairly fascinating stuff. It is, it is a huge area of research literature. And then what I call the framework, and this is the theoretical framework that I chose for this study, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because that's important to understand how I framed um, the study. So conveniently, my study exists right here. We all love Venn diagrams, and that's where the intersection exists. So for those of you who are not spatially inclined, I can also represent this here in a linear fashion so you can understand a little bit more about how um, the research literature um, was represented here and what I looked through in order to have a foundation before I went forward. So I looked a lot at online searching literature, looking at the professional searcher, researcher. There were some confounding factors in the study. One, for example, was subject matter expertise and how do we minimize that so I can focus on just the concepts that are important. I looked at what's happening in LIS education in online searching and also on web-based searching, again, a very large area of literature. And the novice expert area is, again, very large. And one area that I focused on within this, because I think it's important in the education realm as well, is reflection as a practice for learning and also as an expert practice. And the theoretical framework is going to be um, talking about what learning is, particularly for adults, and then the threshold concept theory, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Before we do that, I want to share one model that I think is particularly important for understanding um, how people experience searching, and this is a fairly recent model by Sylvia Edwards, who is one of my advisors from Queensland University. And she identified four categories of how university students experience web-based searching. Very briefly, I'll go through the characteristics because I use these in the study later. But she looked at how university students uh, have awareness structures, and this is kind of their world view of information, the tools that they use, and also what they think about information quality. She also looked at how they approach learning generally, what their confidence level is with regard to um, information technology. She looked at how they respond to obstacles. This was rather interesting. Um, what assumptions they make if something doesn't go well. Um, you know, some of the more basic searchers in uh, category one assume there's something wrong with the tool, that there's something wrong with the search engine. The, the more adept searchers would assume that maybe they're doing something wrong and they did some troubleshooting and tried to figure it out. For example, they had higher levels of persistence as well. She suggested in her researcher, in her research, that there may be aspects of searching experience for experts that were not evident in the students that she studied. So that sort of set a baseline for me in my research to look to see if there might be another category of searcher. The other area I want to highlight here is from the novice expert research, and again, like I said, it's a huge area, so I'm just going to touch on it here. But there are a few interesting things about what experts do differently. And I do want to mention first that experts are not people who are just um, people who've been doing something for a really long time. A lot of years of doing something does not make a person necessarily an expert, and there tend to be very few of them within a discipline. But what they do differently is they structure knowledge differently. They structure it better for performance purposes. They also process ambiguous information differently. Um, they tend to impose meaning on it, whereas novices are misled by it. They solve problems differently. They do a kind of progressive 
problem solving, whereas a novice is more likely to find just the best fit solution and run with that. This is a very <laughs> sort of laughing at myself here because the presentation I'm making is definitely kind of a best fit presentation for purposes of, of uh, giving you an overall view of novice expert research. So this is a, a best fit presentation on this slide. So the other thing that experts do differently is they learn differently. And this, I think, is one of the more interesting <coughs> findings that's been replicated, is that experts start more slowly than novices, but overall they are faster learners. So if that fits you, you can be encouraged if you start slowly. There is a model of skill acquisition that's been around since the late 1960s, and it's been used um, by all kinds of uh, professions and disciplines and researchers. Uh, it's called the Dreyfus Model of Skill Acquisition. It was put together by two brothers who were at UC Berkeley, uh, one in psychology and one in industrial engineering. So they had an interesting combination of skills. And it, it goes through from novice through advanced beginner to competence and proficiency and expert, not that it's linear and that a person always moves uh, straight through um, or even goes all the way through. But this drive model has been around and is often referred to, so I do that as well in my study. So let's take a look at the theoretical framework. And before I do that, this might be a good time to pause and see if any questions have popped up. Nope, it looks like Diane is having connectivity problems. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, do I, Frank, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, I just had a quick question. You said that um, that somebody who's been doing something for a long time is not necessarily an expert. So, uh, but um, could you say that that in in order to become an expert? You, you, you do have to be engaged with something for a while. It's, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will become an expert if you work with something for a while, but is it, is it necessary as a sort of a, a precondition to, to um, does that make sense? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be an expert, but do you need to, to be working with something for a while to be an expert, at, at least the way it's presented in the research that you've viewed? Yes, I would say, um, I would say so. That, that experience is part of expertise. That you, it, it's, it's not likely that you can, you know, jump ahead and, um, you know, do not pass go sort of thing and, and uh, get to expertise without some years, of, years and years of experience. And I'll actually touch on that when I talk to you about how I selected my participants as well. So I think, I think that might help address your question uh, when we get to the methodology. Um, to so thank you for the question, Frank. So we'll move ahead to the theoretical framework here, and this is called threshold concepts. Um, it was created by Meyer and Land um, in 2003, so it's really a fairly recent uh, theory. Uh, thanks for your comment, Frank. Um, and it has a lot of appeal. In fact, research and also practice based on this has just been exploding um, in the last several years. Um, this had a lot of appeal for me as well because it, it works well as a learning framework. So um, this is their basic description of what a threshold concept is. It's a core concept that once understood transforms perception of a given subject. And what this goes back to is uh, a kind of rite of passage experience. In fact, they refer to ethnographic studies done back in 1960s um, by Victor Turner. So any of you who studied anthropology probably know that name. Uh, and it, they're trying to describe a learning experience that really is transformational. And if you've ever struggled with learning something and then once you got it, you, you know, you felt that your understanding was really transformational, then you've probably experienced 
understanding a threshold concept. And so in, in my study, what I set out to do was to identify threshold concepts for search expertise. So a little bit more about what um, another description of a threshold concept. They call it a, something that is akin to passing through a portal or conceptual gateway that accesses previously inaccessible ways of thinking about something. So that's the idea of the picture here of a portal. So let's look a little more closely into what makes a threshold, what makes a concept a threshold concept. I'm going to pause just a second here again. These are the main characteristics that need to be present. Not all of them have to be present for a threshold concept. But first and foremost is that it's transformative. It causes a shift in perception. It's irreversible, not likely to be forgotten or unlearned. We're going to look at each of these more closely in just a moment. It's integrated so that it exposes something previously hidden or where the connectedness was not previously understood. Troublesome. This is an interesting one. Initially, the understanding of it is counterintuitive or uncomfortable. You really have to wrestle with it. And then bounded. This characteristic is not always present. In fact, it's less often present at all. But the concept has terminal frontiers that actually border on other thresholds or other conceptual areas. It might actually define a, a discipline in itself. So let's look at each of these more closely because these are critical to this uh, study. And I've chosen some graphics here to help understand them. Transformative. Life will never be the same after you get your driver's license. It's that kind of experience. So here's one study where they looked at doctoral students and do, doing research and they identified conceptual challenges for those learning to be researchers. Some of these, for example, were understanding argument, understanding theorizing, understanding what a framework is or what knowledge creation is or analysis, what a research paradigm is. And this is, again, a fairly recent study. A lot of this work in the area threshold concepts is very recent, very hard to keep up with. So that's the transformative characteristic. The other one is irreversible. It's like riding a bike. Once you learn, it's not likely to be forgotten or unlearned. No matter what happens, you're not going to forget it. And I think that can happen. Um, I'll give an example here because so many of you have taken classes um, like 202 or a lot of you have taken the searching course 244, you know, once you get the sense of what fields are in a record or the fact that an index exists separate from records, for example, those concepts, um, once you get it, you're, you're not going to forget that and it will, will impact the way you deal with databases, the way you deal with information, the way you deal with, you know, tagging data or whatever, whatever environment it is. Um, it's, it's that kind of a, a concept, perhaps transformative as well. Integrated. So here's where you're pulling together tools and using them as if they are part of your, your own understanding. Um, and it brings together separate concepts and be they become unified in your understanding. The other characteristic is called the troublesome characteristic. And this one, um, the best picture I could think of was the first skiing lesson where you're told to um, do certain things that are uncomfortable and counterintuitive, not what you would think would work, is what works. I always think of my son when he was learning about fractions and he had some real um, interesting ideas about what he thought should work. Um, <laughs> it was definitely a wrestling match in understanding to um, finally get the hang of what fractions were all about. So it must be wrestled with to be grasped. A threshold concept is not something you just read about and you get it. It's something you typically have to wrestle with. It is a struggle. It is not something that's comfortable. 
So here's an example where novices were working on physics problems, and they had lots of misconceptions. I started out as a physics major and ended up with a degree in music, so I, I understand some of this. But the wrestling, and some people don't get past the wrestling stage. Um, it's, it's not like you've always get through that uh, portal. Uh, but they, they referred this to this as confluences. But it's a very interesting idea. Some adults with issues about fractions, yes. <laughs> so. And then bounded. This is where you're not in Kansas anymore. Um, there are some clear boundaries. You've crossed into another area. And it also the concept itself has some boundaries. Some, some researchers have talked about this as actually defining the discipline itself. There might be terminology. It's, it's like it has its own vocabulary. So let's talk about my study and how I put this together and the methodology on the data collection. I think that's often interesting, um, uh, particularly since we have um, mostly students here listening. Um, and a year ago, there were uh, some students like yourself who were um, enlisted to be in the study. I had two groups of participants. I wanted to get people who I believe might be on both sides of this conceptual portal that I was envisioning or perhaps even traveling to it. So I had half of my participants, I had 20 participants total, half of them were highly experienced professional searchers, and half of them were MLIS students who had already completed um, information retrieval and online searching courses, and in those courses shown exceptional ability. So they were pre-selected by their instructors um, as having shown expert-like behaviors, and they were, they were my participants. Um, of the group one, the highly experienced professional searchers, they had an average of 32.7 years of experience as professional searchers. So these were people who um, were teaching in some cases. They had been uh, database designers and developers in some cases. Most of them had had careers with multiple phases in them. Um, some were working as information brokers um, and various kinds of positions. So it was, it was an exceptional group um, with really some deep uh, experience. I collected data through a pre-search interview asking them about their learning experiences. And then they did some search tasks uh, where they had to do a known item search and a subject search. As you folks know, um, known item search is the type where you know when you're done. Subject search is one where it's hard to know if you're done. Um, so then there was a post-search interview as well. Um, the searches served two purposes. It, um, they had to narrate their thoughts and decisions they were making as they did search, which is kind of difficult for some people, like, you know, uh, chewing gum at the same time you're doing something else. But it's a uh, think aloud protocol so that you can find out what you know the mental processes are um, as the person is going through the search. So that was that that was actually very fascinating because often they would demonstrate behaviors and search behaviors that they couldn't actually talk about in the interview. And then in the post-search interview, a lot of times, having just been in the act of doing the search, they would remember experiences that they hadn't thought about in the pre-search interview. So it served a couple of different purposes there. I used grounded theory methods to um, deal with the data analysis. Um, and that describes the methodology. So let's jump right to the findings. Which makes it seem like the data analysis went really quickly, but in fact it took many months. 
<laughs> and anyone who's familiar with grounded theory or any form of qualitative data analysis knows that that's quite typical. So I found that I could identify four threshold concepts for search expertise. Now these were very broad, but that's very typical of threshold concepts. So I will basically cover them here and then go into a little more detail in just a moment. So information environment. To understand the entire information environment was, was one. To understand information structures was another. Information vocabulary was another. And then there was something I call concept fusion or the integration concept, which was the ability to integrate and use all of the other three, and then there were some other defining factors as well, um, was the kind of threshold concept. Now the study was not looking for other things, uh, things other than learning experiences, but in the process I did elicit a lot of other uh, data and some scenes. So I did, I, I am reporting on those as well. I found a lot of information about the pra praxis of search experts, different kinds of approaches and strategies and tactics and tools that they use on a regular basis. So I'm also reporting on those as well. They did not, however, kind of meet the criteria of concept knowledge. Sometimes they were borderline. The other area that came up were traits. There were a lot of different qualities such as persistence or the way in which a search expert identifies his or herself um, and, and particular attitudes. So there were kind of character traits that came up as well. So I'm reporting on those as well. And then of course anytime you're doing research you want to look at what are the implications, you know, what does this mean? What can we do with this? And um, I wanted to look particularly at implications for course design and I, that will come down the road as well. Uh, but those, those um, and, and of course studies of threshold concepts have often said, okay, now here's what we did when we identified threshold concepts for biology. We then redid our course and here's what happened. So I'll be looking at that next. So I said I would look a little more detail on these different concepts. When I talk about information environment as a threshold concept, I mean at a very profound level the total information environment is perceived and understood. So for example, the searcher understands the processes in the creation of a data source. They understand how the publisher ag um, puts together the content how the aggregator aggregates, how the tagger might be tagging, or what's likely to have gone on in the decision making in arriving at those tags. These kinds of things are known at a profound level and they're accommodated in the decision making during a search. The other thing that uh, I identified was information structures as a threshold concept. So again, in, in this area we're talking about index structures, content structures, are understood at a very profound level. Some of these that will be familiar are things like fields, segments are understood and this knowledge impacts search decisions and outcomes. Even retrieval algorithms, how the structures of those algorithms work or perhaps not the details because often search engines are not going to reveal the details of their algorithms, but knowing that they're there and knowing that it's making a difference in the relevance ranking, for example, um, is, is a sign of search expertise. Third one was information vocabulary, and sometimes people jump to thinking this means controlled vocabulary, but it's a lot more than that. I found that, that the really good searchers were just really good with language. Um, they knew how to use terminology that was appropriate for the database, you know, they knew about the thesaurus, but they also just had a lot of fluency in using natural language as well. They automatically thought about synonyms, automatically thought about truncation, thought to look up to see if there were other language-based tools. 
and they had a lot of finesse with this. They were quite adept at shifting gears as needed during the search. Uh, so some of that, and, and, and I also thought, well, I had a couple of participants who had English as a second language. Is that going to be a factor? And it turned out it was not. Um, so, so that was, a, I thought, a, a rather interesting finding because it, it kind of grouped together a lot of different things that were language-based. And then finally, what I'm calling concept fusion was the integration of these three concepts. And there were also some other defining um, attributes for this uh, threshold concept as well. Something that I call the dancer factor, which was the ability to really stay light on your feet and move and shift and uh, you know change direction uh, quickly. So that's one example. Now there always needs to be a representation that's, that's uh, uh, some sort of a in information visualization. So this is a preliminary model for the threshold concepts and it's fairly basic but I have tried to represent three main structures um, or main concepts here of information structures, vocabularies, and the environment. And then the integration of these, which is a little bit difficult because it kind of is the combination, but it also has its own um, parameters as well. And then if you try to create an integrated model, that brings in these other areas of the different practices and traits and qualities. So I've added those into the model in this way. So I thank you for your attention and we'll open it up for questions at this point. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and grab the mic and uh, it, um, this is Frank again. You know, uh, going back to the very beginning of your presentation, uh, one of your early slides, uh, there was a bullet point about how experts um, start slowly in the learning process, uh, more slowly uh, sometimes than um, non-experts or novices uh, or other types of, of searchers. And, and I, f I found that very intriguing. Um, I, I was just curious if, if there were, you know, if you had any more comments on that, like, is how is the fact that they um, start more slowly? Uh, is that a? I, I'm just curious how, why that might be, or whether that how that might contribute to their overall trajectory on their way to becoming experts. That's a great question, Frank. And what I'd like to do is follow up with you by sending you some of the articles on that, um, because that particular area of the literature review um, is not at my fingertips, uh, you know, or on the tip of my tongue. But h how that happens, I'm, um, you know, I think a, a lot of it, a lot of the findings on that, um, I'm not sure if, if they explain, well, why does it work that way, <laughs> or if it's just, here's what we were able to um, report on. Yes, Alice, I think I think I could, or if I send it to Frank, maybe he can distribute it. Would, would that work, Frank? Yeah, we can find a way. Uh, maybe what we could do is just, um, would it be OK to just um, link those on our website somehow, and folks could just grab them off the website? Would that be acceptable? Sorry, I forgot to click. Um, yeah, that would be fine. Just jotting it down here on that article, or so there might be more than one. So, if anyone else has a question, you can either just grab the mic if it's free, or you can raise your hand first if you if you like, or you can just type something into the chat window as well. And I did want to say too, I meant to cover your uh, first question, Frank, a little more. Um, in depth when I talked about the 
number of years of experience and what's, you know, how that's a factor in expertise and whether or not, um, there were two things I wanted to share was, um, you know, I mentioned that the participants I had who were in the group one, who were the highly experienced, had just about 33 years on average of, of experience. Um, but I found that some of them did not display expert-like behaviors, you know, so, so I think it was, yeah, thanks, okay. Um, but they were very, very good tool users is the way I ended up thinking about it. Um, but but that's, that's kind of a, it was an interesting thing. But, and, and also the other thing I wanted to share was one person who clearly was an expert, she said she was speaking to one of the uh, main publishers of one of our industry journals, and I have to be careful how I, what I say because a lot of these people were very <laughs> protective about their identities. Um, and uh, she said, you know, they were saying, how many expert searches do you think there are? And they decided there were fewer than 12. <laughs> so I think that was, that was an interesting number they actually came up with at one point while at a conference. So I see a question from Judy. Yes, in the whole field. Did you find out how these experts actually perform their searches? Um, well, I, I did observe them doing searches. There were a couple who were not willing to actually search with someone else watching. Uh, so those did not actually do a live search. Um, uh, but I'm not, let, me, let me make sure I'm understanding your question, Judy. Do you want to just take the mic? Judy, uh, if you look up at the top, uh, on the left side of the, um, the software, up near the top where you see my picture right now, there's a little talk button. Uh, you click on that to talk. And when you're done talking, just make sure you click it again to release the mic so that someone else can use it. Like that? Okay, can you hear me? All right, so I, I'm just wondering, like, um, you know, you're saying that that they're, they're experts and that, you know, we're these ML, ML, MLIS students and that, you know, we could be on our way, except sometimes when I'm doing searches, I think I'm such a novice, it's not even funny, and so I'm wondering, like, what tools are out there that I should be using to be on my way to be an expert, although I think it would take years and years. I'm just saying, you know, the right path to get there, because sometimes I feel like I'm, like, on the computer for hours, and then I find very little. Yeah, good question, Judy. And, and I think th the thing is, that I think that's why I found it so interesting to look at concepts, because I think the tools are, are not enough, you know, and the tools change from um, search engine to search engine. So it was trying to find out, well, what, what is it if I, if I learn these tools on LexisNexis, you know, how is that going to help me on the next search engine that comes around, or the next time they change something on LexisNexis? Um, or, you know, what, how will this help me be better when I use Google? And, and I know I try, I try to do that in the classes I teach now, uh, but I think there's, there's, you know, room for improvement. Um, and so, so finding the tools, I think, is, is one thing, and becoming really adept at those tools um, is, is really important. And then there's this facility that happens with the tools um, I'm trying to think of what one of the people said. Um, she said it was like when she started the golf, she had to get all the mechanics down and know just how to turn her right leg and turn, turn the knee in just a certain amount and have her shoulder down a certain amount. And you do have to go through the motions. And then eventually it becomes second nature. You don't think about the mechanics anymore. Um, and that's, I think that's sort of how, how you're, you make a transition eventually. And, you know, the other metaphor that worked for me was to think of a musician who, who ultimately is able to improvise um, and, and not looking at the music or maybe all they've got is a chord chart. But that's, um, 
you know, that's what I would say there is, is, is you know, you do muck around with the tools, and but but trying to get get beyond that is where what I'm thinking about is is where it, it becomes conceptual. And there, another researcher who's at University of Washington has this idea that you you divide it between. Uh, the conceptualist and the operationalist, and the operationalist is, is strictly a good tool user. So I don't know if I answered your question. Can you let me know, Judy, if I did? Yes, you did. Thank you. And my four students who take two, have taken 244 know that I make them write down what they're thinking about in their searches and why they're making the decisions they're making. <laughs> so um, that that reflection practice is part of that. Um, part of what moves you beyond using a tool well and having it become second nature as well is, is reflection. So, okay, I see something from Kathy in the chat box. Let me take a look and read it. Well, thanks. Um, I don't think the dissertation will be published other than on the Queensland University website, but they, they actually do a great job at, at making those available. Um, I can't think of exactly the name of their website. Um, Laura might know, Laura's still here, she's in my cohort. I don't think she's still here. Um, and I'm, you know, looking at an article or two and a conference paper on this as well, Kathy. So it'll be posted on my faculty page when, when it is available. Um, I have another question. Um, I actually um, listened to a different video yesterday, too, or one from the California Library Association on, on different kinds of courses and stuff. And, and this is the end of my second semester um, in the program. And now you're mentioning um, Library 244. And now I'm just getting, I, I feel almost more confused on what kind of courses I should be taking in order to like be a well-rounded well librarian. Like when I, I guess I'm like getting confused and I'm wondering like is 244 like maybe a must have before you graduate? Well, so Keenan, uh, uh, bye, David. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I I couldn't say. I mean, there's so many different courses and there's so many different interests. Um, there's certainly a lot of students take it as an elective. It seems to have a lot of. Um, students choosing it, but I think that's a good question for your academic advisor who probably knows you better and knows your interests and, uh, you know, where you're headed. And, and I think the 210 course, the reference course also certainly covers a lot of, um, from, from what I understand, looking at a lot of e-portfolios, um, as I do, because I teach 289 as well, uh, that, that they cover searching to some, to some extent. But, but that's a question that I, you know, I don't want to go into too in, in great depth, but the, um, uh, you know, check with other students as well and, and, and your, your advisor. Hey, I was just going to jump in here real quick. Uh, Ellie had raised her hand a while back, so I wanted to give her a chance to grab the mic. Um, Ellie, did you still have the question, your question? I, I noticed you lowered your hand. Um, yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, uh, Virginia, I had a quick question. Could you repeat what you said about the um, the English language learners who were in your study? I, I think I missed what you said. My first my first understanding was that you said that language ability is is very important um, to to be an expert. Um, but then I thought I understood you to say that the English um, learners were, didn't have any problems. So I was just wondering if you could repeat what you said there. Thanks, Ellie. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, what, I, what I said was in this one um, finding about a threshold concept being information vocabulary um, and that being rather broad-based of anything having to do um, with language. Um, I thought that the two participants I have, I, I had who had English as a second language might not, you know, demonstrate such a facility with, with that area. 
and in fact that wasn't true. Um, one in particular was just amazing, <laughs> to be honest, and um, and he was one of the novice searchers, uh, and um, so it seemed to be a kind of fluency that um, transcended, you know, what what your first or second language was. Uh, it was it was a way of thinking about language that that. Um, uh, they, you know, these, these participants could apply to the search situation. Um, so, so I thought that was interesting. So that that's what I had said there. Judy, you can just go ahead and grab the mic if you still have a question. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a two-part question. And the first one is concerning uh, something that you just touched on, uh, Virginia, and it has to do with English as a second language. Now, um, it seems that that was, in comparing the experts versus novices, that was one feature that you looked at, uh, English versus non-English speakers. Did you look at any other of the other features and compare any of the other features among the, the um, the participants, such as whether they were male versus female distinctions, or anything uh, age-wise, age differences distinction. That's that's my first question, and I'll let you answer it. Thanks, Judy. Yeah, I um, first of all, I did not compare the novices to the experts. Um, I chose novices who were highly able. So you know that the idea was that they were hopefully. They were displaying expert-like behaviors. They were at the you know high end, if you will, um, and hopefully, you know, journeying through a, a, a learning portal that that had some threshold concepts um, associated with it. Um, and I did not look at gender. I did not look at language. I was just in this particular case of um, language-based tools. I thought. I wonder if something's going to crop up here with these two participants. One was in the highly experienced group, one was in the novice group, um, and it did not happen. So um, as far as age, I did track that and report on it, um, and simply because um, all the novices were, I think the oldest one was 41, um, and the Youngest one, what was the youngest one? Was in early 20s. I did, I did binning. You know, I did, I did like age range groups um, for for record, reporting this. And then the the, but there was no overlap in these age ranges between the novices and the highly experienced group, just by nature of how I pre-selected them. Um, Everyone in the highly experienced group had at least 20 years of experience. So, by virtue of that, they were, I think the youngest one was late 40s. But I did not, I did not, you know, look at their demographics and, and analyze for that. And I stated that saying, you know, this is a limitation of the study that I, I did not look at gender, I did not look at, at um, ages. Other than looking at the years of experience as a as a pre-selection criteria um, for the highly experienced group. Thanks for the question, Judy. Let me know if I answered it okay. Well, that was that was yeah a good answer. Uh, I then the second part of it is between the novices and the experts, who came out on top? Who were the winners? Who were the winners? Um, so I wasn't comparing the two groups, so I couldn't say who won. Um, you know, I was looking for uh, concepts that they, you know, hopefully both displayed. And what was interesting, the, the other thing, um, um, that that I think, so so I'm. Can't really answer that question. Nobody won. Um, I, you know, among the the highly experienced group, I found some who I felt really had expert behaviors, and I found some who were really good tool users. And within the novice group, thank you, Christina. Um, 
within the novice group, I found some who were just extraordinary expert like, and I thought, wow, I can't wait to see what this person is going to be doing in 10 years. Um, and others who just had these little glimmers, you know, and I can't say that I can always know exactly what, what a person is, is um, a person's aptitudes are, but um, that, um, you know, they, they had performed exceedingly well in, in their coursework, so they obviously had already demonstrated something before they were um, participants, and then they had to be willing, of course, to, to give up some time and do some exercises. Um, so there, there, there weren't winners in this. Um, the other thing I, I will mention, though, in that was try, for, for a participant to try and describe their learning experiences and to say what they think is important and to talk about concepts is incredibly difficult because we tend not to be very articulate about these things. Um, so this, this was an, you know, an exercise for them. And I will say that some of the novices, I think because they were describing things that had happened very recently or that they were in the middle of experiencing, were, were quite articulate at describing them. Um, so, so it turned out that it was very good to include people who um, were novices, very able novices in the group. So I sort of answered your question and answered one you didn't ask as well. Thank you. I, I was just hoping from a personal standpoint as a graduating student that, uh, that the MLS, MLIS students had, uh, had really, uh, had really uh, come across as the best. But I'll, 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 I appreciate your diplomacy and I thank you for your answer. Well, I'm glad to hear you're graduating, Judy, because you've got your fill of, of having me as an instructor too, so that's great. Um, okay, well, we're almost uh, at an hour here. Uh, I guess maybe if there's if there's one or two more burning questions, um, don't want to. I know um, Virginia is very busy. She sounded like she was busy when I was uh, contacting her about uh, doing this event. So I don't want to keep her too much longer. Um, so I will go ahead and release the mic and let Carletta ask her question. So um, I have. A uh, question for you, but because I wasn't able to take your class, which is why I wanted to come here tonight. Um, yeah. But what would you recommend for those of us who are coming to the end of our MLIS uh, studies? Um, I'm not graduating um, this uh, spring, but um, I'll be finishing in December. What would you recommend for um, those of us who are still in the program but don't have um, any more options for taking your class? to do instead. I feel, I guess my feeling about searching goes up and down. Sometimes I feel like I've learned a lot and I do really well and then there are other times that I just have the hardest time finding something that I've actually found before and now I can't find it again. So what would you recommend for us to become those experts now that we're finishing school? Wow, great question. I mean, there are opportunities for, you know, free classes and webinars that you can take. Um, most of the vendors offer those and you know often they'll give you a trial password um, for while you're still a student. So I would take advantage of those. Um, there, there are certainly you know amazing databases through King Library too. So I'm, I mean, I'm sure you've used those because you've done your share of research papers at this point if you've got uh, you know if you're finishing up in the fall. Um, but it just seems the more you do, um, you know, the better you're going to get. But I, I, again, I think you can also get stuck in ruts. We, we can all do that. And, and you do the same thing over and over again. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's, I, I would say some of the vendor training and tutorials, the free tutorials um, can, okay, great, can, can work really well um, to take advantage of those because those commercial, Databases really have features that you won't find elsewhere. Um, but you know, even Google added a proximity operator about a year and a half ago, but they, they really didn't ballyhoo it very much. Um, but you know, they have an around operator. 
Um, oh, great. You were in Amelia's class. Yeah. Amelia and I coordinate various things, so I, um, I'm very glad you got to take her class. And she really knows business information, just, um, you know, she's a real expert in that. So uh, that, um, those are the recommendations I would make. I mean, there are also some wonderful books on this, too. I mean, there, some of them have not been updated. Uh, Super Searcher series and on Dialog, there's the How Do I Do It um, series that's available. Dialog's migrating now to the ProQuest platform, so a lot of that's going to be an upheaval. I mean, this is the last semester that we're going to use Dialog Classic. Um, for those of you who are in my class this semester, I apologize that we didn't, that, that didn't migrate sooner. But um, and I'm, I'm working on a book right now. That'll be my next thing, which will be a book about searching a textbook for NLIS students. So that's um, but that won't be until next year that it'll be out. So um, what will be used next? It will be a ProQuest platform of dialogue. It'll be you know all kinds of bells and whistles, but you'll still be able to use the kind of command mode if you want, so that you have that transparency and the control that we all love to have over our search results. So people are pretty excited about it. It's already available for some of the science and technology databases, but it's not available for the free student passwords yet. And Amelia and I were both on what they called their expert panel when they were designing the um, product. So that was pretty exciting. It was a small group of us. So. Um, you know, the word expert does get used a lot. I have to share a funny story about the word expert because Google published a white paper. Um, no, it wasn't a white paper. That was something else. Um, my literature review is, is staggeringly um, huge. Um, a conference paper they had where they said it takes uh, one month to become an expert searcher. So um, I had to snag that one because the word expert really is tossed around rather uh, lightly these days. Okay. Well, um, oh, do we have another question? Sometimes people hit the wrong button. I think on this new interface, sometimes people mean to hit something and they hit the ha raise your hand. Um, all right. Well, we're at uh, a little after seven here, so uh, I think we'll we'll uh, wrap it up now. Um, uh, thanks so much, Virginia, for the very very interesting talk. Uh, it was. The, the subject matter was very fascinating and also getting some insight into the research process, your research process and, and what you're doing as, a, as an actual PhD candidate. Uh, I don't know if any folks in our audience are doing that. Uh, I know one of our, our um, officers for the chapter has applied into the uh, PhD program. Unfortunately, I don't think she was here with us tonight. Um, maybe she'll watch the, uh, the recording. So again, I want to say on behalf of the chapter and everyone who attended, thanks so much for, for your talk. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Sarah now for just a couple quick concluding comments, and then we'll call it a night. Thanks. I'd also like to echo Frank. And um, thank you, Virginia, for your fantastic, informative presentation. Um, we're all so grateful that you shared your research tonight with the student chapter. And I'd also like to thank Frank for organizing and moderating this program. Um, for those who attending, for those attending who are interested in becoming involved with SJSU ACES, as you can see, our web links are provided on the screen. Um, also, in addition, the student chapter's next business meeting is on Wednesday, May 2nd at 6 p.m. Thank you to everyone for attending this program, and I hope you have a good evening. Good night. <laughs>